welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. A longtime developer in the RPG Maker scene with, st with stuff like Stellar Bewitching, Astral Awakening, Esper Unleashed, and most recently, um, Raveheart. The one and only Star Mage. How are you doing tonight? Or, t or this afternoon, I guess, in your case. Fucking time zones. <laughs> Hello, um, it's nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, it's been great. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, you most you've mostly worked within the RPG Maker space. So, since I usually open with humble beginnings, mm -hmm. talk talk to me about what about um what you, what your introduction to RPG Maker was. Oh yeah, that was a very long time ago. I was still a student that time. Um, I guess that was 2016. And I first saw RPG Maker 2003 on Steam. And I was like, you know, as a an all-time fan of the JRPG genre, especially the Final Fantasy series, I was very interested. So um, I got the copy of it and made my first game which was blue skies and it was a very like fun experience a learning experience mm -hmm. and you've you've made quite you've made quite a few se series and, ex and um exper experiences what both in mm -hmm. both in that space and as well as a bit of a bit of dips here and there in visual novels and on your mm -hmm. web, on your website, you you cited Final Fantasy and Grandia being influences, and that's a very wide net. Were yeah. there, were there any um, what what would you say was your gate was your for lack of a better term gateway drug, when it came to Final Fantasy and Grandia? Oh yeah, um, if if you know they're very addicting to me, um, the series and uh. I finished Final Fantasy IX first. I know it's crazy because most people finish seven first, but I finished FF nine first, and and then I went to Final Fantasy X, and it was the most um how that was the time I got cap captured into like the RPG genre. I just love everything about it, the details about you know the faith, you know Yuna being a summoner, everything like it really captured me, and then. With Grandia, of course, like the 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 feeling of having this grand adventure, like the feeling of this, like that's the tone the game sets, where you know the main characters they're going on this grand adventure to get to the end of the world, like that really captured me. So um, I kind of want to ha convey that same feeling to other people with my games. So hopefully, I did. <laughs> That kind of that kind of journey is interesting because, ob obviously, with some of the earlier stuff, it definitely leans into high fantasy. But with mm -hmm. rave with rave heart, that is leaning more into science fiction fantasy, almost space opera. Exactly. And I'm cur I'm curious what I'm curious what was it ju was it just a case of wanting to try a new angle? What prompted the shift into more of a science fiction leaning? Mm -hmm. Um. So my my first games before Raveheart were usually fantasy. So when I started developing Raveheart, I thought to myself like, and I was playing Mass Effect that time. So there's this influence already in me where an XCOM. If you heard of XCOM, oh yes. Sorry, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was playing this sci-fi games already. So in my mind, I had influences, and I was like, you know what? Why don't I make a two D like Final Fantasy type? RPG, but in space. So that's where Raveheart came to be. <laughs> Just curious, but did anyone bring up the name Fantasy Star or Star Ocean to you during a lot that during that? Yes, a lot of people actually told me that um, it looked like Fantasy Star. And to be honest, I haven't played the series yet. I've been meaning to, but 
I've been seeing it a lot and I can see why because of the aesthetics, I guess, like the blue haired protagonist and all that. But I really want to get to that series soon. Mm -hmm. um, the advice I give I give to people is um what is it is an interesting beast though um trying though trying to get a hold of get get a hold of the original original is gonna be tricky because that wasn't on the Genesis, it was on the master system. The, fir the mm. first console that Sega had made. Um, two is an all-time classic in that series. Three is the Black Sheep. Um, mm. <laughs> and four was a re was a return to form. And the online games are a different matter entirely. Um, that's an apples mm. to oranges thing. I see. Um, but the the interesting thing with science fiction is that developing a science fiction world is a series of questions the answers to which prompt even more questions so exactly before you even before you even put um line to code as it were did you end up writing like like some sort of design doc or or series bible as far as the world of raveheart um first or was mm -hmm. it the case where the chicken and the egg were developing at the same time um yeah I'm glad you asked that because I actually had, I don't know if I still have it in my files, but I had a a huge like text file of, because I already planned everything like the galaxy, the planets that were going to, that were going to be present, the, the sectors and, you know, all the races is going to be in there and the different unique characteristics or abilities. It was all, um, already documented and so when i implemented them in the game i already had an idea of you know where the the player starts and how they're going to be introduced to the different sectors and planets mm -hmm. and i wish i still had that but you know it's a long time already <laughs> yeah and i'm not i can't say that the that the design that the design bible is my own term because I've seen mm -hmm. that I've seen that um, concept be thrown about when it comes to um, television production. The idea is that it's some document that contains all that contains all of the material regarding the world that story is taking place in, and characters, and just one unified document that everybody can reference to keep things consistent. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. I think I, f I think I first heard it when I was going through some behind the scenes regarding um, gargoyles. Oh, I see. Um, I love the series. That was also where I came I came across the term tears and tent poles, which mm -hmm. was basically their compromise because around that time, networks really really didn't like um, serialization. They li they like the idea of being able to slot whatever episode they feel like in a given time slot mm -hmm. the compromise was okay these episodes you can slot anytime but only between these more specific ones mm -hmm. i see oh and they, they called it tears and tent poles but mm -hmm. when when as you mentioned galaxy and that's a that's apropos because while there is always a design doc whenever making a world when going into science fiction the scale goes up significantly and even mm -hmm. more so with with space opera so the i suppose one of the one of the big things that that would have to be tackled is when dealing with a sci-fi fantasy which i'd say raveheart very much is uh, what was what would you say the solution you came, you came up with when it came to the the magic or equivalent um conundrum you mean like um, the magical side of the sci-fi game or something? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um. So in my game in Raveheart, there's an energy called Ether. Mm -hmm. So this is um the let's say the sort of ar arcane or the magic type energy where there are psychics. So there are aliens who can use psychic abilities. And they spend this energy called ether, and which is kind of like their magic. Mm -hmm. So they they can use telekinetics or telepathy and stuff like that. Yeah, and one of the other big questions that ends up having to be asked when you're dealing with multiple planets is mm -hmm. the FTL issue. And there's 
well, there's no one right way to answer that. Some cases, ha some cases have it where you're jumping into a qu a quasi dimension. Some of them, it, it some of them, there is some degree of go of going through um gates, going through certain gateways or certain points. Some will some will do a little of column A and column B. Mm -hmm. What appro what approach did you did you decide to go with as far as how people travel between planets in that world? Mm -hmm. So um, I did mention before that it's I got a lot of inspiration from Mass Effect during my develop de development of Raybar. So I took that approach where there's sort of this ship called the Atlas or the main mothership of sorts, the same way like Mass Effect has Nomandi. So um, in that mothership, you get to talk to the operator and you can ask him to take the mothership to different sectors or planets and and land there so you can explore these different cities planets and yeah that's about it. it's like sort of like um just a selection menu to choose between so sort of like that but i wish there was a way to implement like you know a literal space travel but that would be like a large scope already <laughs> yeah and, uh obviously obviously that obviously that's a trick that's a tricky affair the it's it is funny you mentioned the the Nor the normandy because mm -hmm. the way the way that the titular mass effect works in that in that series is using element 0 to basically violate the laws of con of conservation of energy you know mm -hmm. reducing reducing mass then throwing something at high velocity then having it return to its normal mass the mass relays are just are just a um, souped up version of that concept. Oh. Yeah, I, I love the complexity of it. Yeah, I mean the the complexity is basically the equivalent of fi of firing yourself out of a rocket, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think it it is funny that you bring that you bring up Mass Effect as well because. With games mm -hmm. like Mass Effect and and well let, let me let me back myself up a bit. Mm -hmm. With a lot of with a lot of fantasy games and stories, there have there have always been certain there have always been certain repeatable archetypes that can build that you can build characters around. Whether whether mm -hmm. that be knights, whether that be wizards, whether that be warlocks, um, whether that be um, archers, the kind of things that would be the kind of things that would be character classes in a tabletop game. Or yeah, I... or units in a war game. Mm -hmm. With science fit with science fiction, the doors to the door to that kind of thing is swung wide open. So, when developing that document, did you develop certain um, character archetypes before built before building specific characters, or was it one of those cases where one fed into the other? I did have a document already on the archetypes. Like for example, um, there's this um psychic group called the cypher's kinetic association so they're basically psychics with with abilities to you know do telekinesis and stuff like that but they're also assassins so they they can use daggers which is where the protagonist of this game belongs to so it's sort of like the assassin mage if that makes sense in a fantasy setting but instead he's in sci-fi so it's basically like an esper but you know, he can use the dagger as well. So there's a lot of that I've planned. And then the healer in the game, um, the archetype I used was someone who's an empath, like someone who can feel the emotions of others, who can who can manipulate their feelings or their bodies to heal them, something like that. So yeah, I did have those archetypes planned. Mm -hmm. And part of part of the reason i i end up asking that kind of thing is again with with how wide open the possibilities are when it comes to space opera it's important mm -hmm. to to narrow things down now if i if if i'm reading things correctly and th and this is the problem with the fact that there isn't really a timeline with how think with how things like itch pages are are set up where i can measure mm -hmm. how someone develop how someone develops over several games 
Um, for the, for most of your entries, you were strictly turn based, but with Raveheart, you implemented a um, active time approach. Um, what prompt? What prompted shifting into that? Oh, um, Raveheart isn't actually. Um, it actually is still turn based. Um, it follows the conditional turn battle system, sort of like the same with Final Fantasy X. So um, I may have had handled act active time on my previous um, entries, but for Avart, I did decide later on to turn it into a conditional turn battle system. Right. My my apologies. That there may have been some cross wiring during during some of the research. <laughs> Again, it's okay. I like to try. I like to try and set up a timeline of de of development, and mm -hmm. when de when dealing with projects that go through a bunch of iterations, because I th I think there are several de several um, demos before the full before the full version. Mm -hmm. It becomes a bit trickier to to develop a timeline in my usual style. Mm, yeah, yeah. I mean, not impossible, but but, and nine, ninety percent of the time, I'm getting I'm gonna be able to get it close to the mark. But there's unfortunately that ten percent. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but when it comes, but since since you had brought that up, was it was doing that was doing that sort of um, flexible turn based approach a me was that done? Was that done as a tribute to FF10, or was there a um, design reason why you wanted to go in that direction? Yeah, it actually is a tribute to FF10 because um, I did love the conditional turn battle system from that game, and I kind of wanted to sort of, in a way, be inspired by it. So, um, I guess Final Fantasy X is sort of like a, an, a combination of my inspiration from Final Fantasy X and Mass Effect. So that's what happened. Sci-fi, but a turn-based conditional battle system. <laughs> yeah. The other thing is, instead, in some of the projects you, in some of the characters, you have them using um, straight-up EP, and for others, you have them using um, SP. Mm-hmm. And... I'd like to di I'd like to dig a little bit more into the thought the thought process and adding the second resource. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, most of the characters who uses TP instead of EP are those that are mostly physical attack based. Mm -hmm. So their skills are more, you know, something that you have to charge. TP for so you can use them. So it's like this um, double slash things going on, and they're more attack based. And the the people, that, the characters that I had use EP were they had skills where there were you know spells, healing, or um, putting enemies to sleep, etc. <laughs> mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And. Given that now, obviously, I came I came into Raveheart significantly late, but mm -hmm. how long how long was the turnaround time between that? Would you say between setting the project up and putting and putting the thing out on Steam and itch in its full form, not just not just a um, demo? Yeah, um, it took me about two years to complete it. I was. I started, I guess, I believe it was 2018 when I started developing Raveheart, and mind you, there was there was like a long hiatus between, you know, those years. So maybe it was like, um, less than two years of development, and you know, there was a lot. There's just a lot of changes from the demo. There's just a lot, and I can remember I remember how much things have improved thanks to a lot of the feedback that I received from the community so yeah that was very helpful mm -hmm. uh, were were in that development were was there any in, was there any instance of an idea that you thought you thought would be a surefire winner during development but once it was out in the wild it cre it um created problems yeah um 
um, when you said it was active time, that was that's that used to be rave hard. Rave hard used to be active time, and I thought it would be really cool to make it active time during my development process. But it had a lot of problems during the the middle of the development because I just found that it's it's a bit buggy and it really doesn't you know complement the rest of the codes on my game and. It had a lot of problems, people noticing there were bugs and errors. So I had to move the conditional turn battle system because of that. And I'm glad I did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, with and truth, truth be told, I can understand why that would create some issues since some. Um... Mm -hmm. It took it took a long time. It took a long time for active time battle in the gauge based approach to um, actually manifest proper. And it's the re and some of the, and given how a lot of companies were using their own proprietary programming language, that made things even more tricky. Um, yeah. Like the reason why the reason why Square never adopted the battle system that was used in Chrono Trigger again was because. That was an absolute nightmare to program. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> and I've seen some. I've seen some say, "How could it be that bad? It's just, it's just um, active time battle, but, but with 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 characters on the same map." That's honestly the problem. Because, yeah, because it's crazy. All because of all of the variables you have to account for when it comes to positioning. Exactly. Um, it's what it. I think you can. I think you can probably relate to this, but a lot of people um, have don't quite grasp how game how game design and game programming and just programming in general is akin to a is akin to a watch. Every mm -hmm. every every gear is in place to do exactly what it needs to do, and if even one of them is off, the watch is useless. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. <laughs> just one bug, everything falls into pieces. Well, if you want an example of that, look at the blood plague incident in the early days of World of Warcraft. Mm, really? Yeah, I, this was there was a late game boss that ha that had a debuff called Corrupted Blood, that mm -hmm. would dr it would drain your health very quickly because this was meant to be a a raid boss after people had mm -hmm. done the main campaign, and you could pass by walking past other players, you could pass that debuff onto them. Mm -hmm. But there was one little oversight. Hunters have pets, and those pets could have that debuff as well. Oh my god! <laughs> and nor normally, th normally this is meant to be isolated to just that raid area. But the pets mm -hmm. could could carry the th could carry the thing and not um, get. Ca oh get my KO'd. god! And once it got once that debuff got out into the wild with with all the players outside <laughs> of that raid. All hell broke loose for months. Oh my god, that was like the COVID of wow. <laughs> well, it, it's funny you mention that because it actually was the the events of what happened was studied <laughs> by epidemiologists to see how people would react during a real world plague. Oh my god, seriously, that's crazy. Yeah, it's one it's one of those hindsight kind of things. Oh my god, you know. But again, one one little oversight and everything goes goes straight to hell. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And I'd s now given and and of course when it comes to bringing the, bringing this to something like Chrono Trigger, when you have a bunch of people who up until that point had only had had it had it more or less grandfathered in to have a separate battle um, map. Mm -hmm. Um, it's going to be tricky for for them to now in it, now have the exploration map use the use the same framework. Even, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. Even years later, that's that was still an issue. I remember listening to the behind the scenes for um, Halo Reach, where they talked about wanting to integrate the story maps with the with the with the multiplayer maps, and mm -hmm. that it. The the documentary said it was a big pain in the butt. Now I don't know if we'd do it again if we were to do this game all over. <laughs> exactly. Yes, I can't imagine how hard it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, is it possible to do it? Yes, 
But just because you can doesn't necessarily mean you should. Exactly. <laughs> and I'm I'm pretty sure you've had a few ca cases wor working on this of ju of just things that you had an idea on how you want to do th something it just would mm -hmm. not cooperate. Like, yeah, like a lot of times. Like banging your head against the wall kind of uncooperative. <laughs> yeah. I had this moment. This Were, was there was there any any case you can think of of just something did not want did not want to work? Oh yeah, um, this is this is something I've been wanting to do for a while, which is the uh, tactical battle system, kind of like Fire Emblem. If you're mm. familiar with the series, oh yeah, um, yeah, I love that series so much, and I kind of want to make my own through RPG Maker, and then there's this. Um, Sim RPG, what was it? Sim RPG Maker, as RPG Maker, which is literally used to make Fire Emblem type games, but I couldn't like for the love of me make it work. Like, <laughs> I just can't. So I stuck with turn base. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I can, I can, I can certainly see, I can certainly see it. There's the old expression, eyes bigger than your stomach. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh. I kind of wish someone would t someone would tell Chris Roberts that, but that's another story. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> I have I have a list of things on my wall of things that came out before Star Citizen. Mm -hmm. I had to retire that list eventually because it because it got so long it reached from these t from my ceiling all the way to the floor. On the oh wall. my god! <laughs> and. The the thing when the that that does bring that does bring me to the difficulties with RPG Maker is a relatively simple affair though people are start I'd say in the last few years people have started to make packages to make more um, complex setups especially mm -hmm. after Octopath Traveler. Mm -hmm. um, have you have you seen any of the any of the attempts to infl to introduce like break mechanics and and the like? A lot, like um, in the RPG Maker community, there's like a lot of developers who I know who have really, um, you know, broke broke out of the box or went beyond the usual turn-based or the usual like graphic setup. And if I, you know, I can I can't really name them all, but there's a lot of developers I know who have even done 3D. So that's really fun. Like even I. Because there's already a plugin in RPG Maker where you can make like a 3D area, like you can make the maps look 3D. So it was really cool to see these other developers like explore that or you know touch their hands and those kinds of things, trying to make a Octopath clone. So I'm excited to where um, the RPG Maker community um, develops. Yeah. And it's there's always going there's always going to be crazy bits of experimenting. I, I'm per, I'm person mm -hmm. I'm personally hoping because because it's not it's not in my wheelhouse, but I'm hoping one of these days I can I can somehow bully somebody into making, um, <laughs> into ma into making it making something in RPG Maker, but with Max. Max, what's Max? Giant stumpy robots. <laughs> oh my god! Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, that would be so cool. I agree. Um, especially if they can, if if all, even if all they're doing is just ripping off front mission, that's a start. Yeah, it would be so cool. An RPG maker with Max. Yeah. Oh my god, you're giving, you're giving me ideas. <laughs> the only reason I'm not doing it is because is because that's not my expertise. I'm far more of a of a tabletop designer who studies who studies video games to get new to get new or just crazy ideas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's, that's really cool. Oh, because some some of my colleagues have had this idea of video games and tabletop games being isolated from each other, Al almost um almost like there's some sort of v video game and tabletop apartheid, but. Mm -hmm. I have, but through studying history, I've come to the realization that's not the case. There, mm -hmm. there was a attempt to put D and D on P on PC all the way back in the seventies with the Play-Doh modules. Mm -hmm. 
Oh. So there's no region for it. Yeah, and the now, gra granted, I I don't I'm not surprised that a lot of people don't know about the plate about the Plato engine. That was a very 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 early iteration of what would become um, PCs. Mm, yeah, that that sounds new to me. I haven't heard of it yet. Oh, and and this was still in that this was still in that age where a computer looked like looked like the kind of thing that you'd see in like a like a spy movie in the sixties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. Oh, you know, just just this ungodly monstrosity. <laughs> And of of course of course um that wouldn't last, but it's one of those things that get, where um it's important to it's important to study history because video games and tabletop games have gone along have grown up alongside each other for decades. Yeah, yeah, like I can see that how they both relate to each other. Mm -hmm. And okay. Admittedly, the the Plato computer wasn't as big as some of the, as some of those early ones, but it was still pr it was still pretty big. And mm -hmm. just to just to el just to illustrate what I mean as far as the size, here's a bit. I'm going to send you a bit of stock art to demonst to demonstrate it. Okay. Oh, I see. <laughs> like, oh my God! It looks like a television set. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. Interesting to and see the design. Yeah, it was. It it started out in the the programs the thing started out in the sixties and eventually would ex, would expand, but it was most. But um, not only was it an early example of computers, but also a proto proto example of what of what would be of uh, what would be become commonplace when it came to the internet mm, I see and of course it didn't take long before people started to make games on it and even and mm -hmm. even less until until someone tried to make d and d on it wow I want to check check that out you know like the original d and d game <laughs> yeah the it's it's one it's one of those th it's a very rudimentary affair but it de it definitely shows how um, how these things kind of intersect with each other but yeah exactly um when now given given the fact that you have characters with melee weapons you already mentioned daggers i've i've seen swords with the research that i've been able to do mm -hmm. and have and have firearms has the question been broached to you how you can have pe how you can have people with swords and with guns in the same universe? Um. Yeah. Uh, this is actually the first time I've been asked that. <laughs> Come to think of it, yeah. Um. So. It was supposed to be like the the normal thing or the normal usual thing in this universe where the soldiers use as me melee weapons alongside guns. Mm -hmm. Is that sort of like they use lightsabers or you know the swords, the smelly swords with like you know plasma in them? Or mm -hmm. it is like fun it is funny mm -hmm. to bring up um, lightsabers in the Star Wars because um, mm -hmm. in in Knights of the Old Republic they actually an they actually answered that. Um, really? pers personal sh personal shielding was not was um was more or less commonplace in the old republic mm -hmm. it's just, but melee weapons could go could go past that um uh, so there's a compensation for using melee weapons yeah i mean the the shields were the shields will give you some modicum of protection against blaster fire but up but up close not so much um mm -hmm. the force shields in in say dune worked in a similar manner I see. That's really cool. Like, I should steal that concept. <laughs> great, so, bad artist copy, great artist steal. <laughs> I, th I think is what Banksy had said a while back. And 
Well, Banksy's one of the few people in this universe who can out-troll me, which is saying a lot. <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, a few years ago, he he auctioned off a painting called, called Girl with Balloon, but nobody paid much attention to the fact that the frame seemed a bit big for the painting. Mm -hmm. And the, until the auction ended, and as soon as soon as as soon as the as soon as the hammer was hit and the painting was sold, all of a sudden the painting starts sinking down into a shredder. Mm -hmm. Oh my god! <laughs> this unfortunate. <laughs> and when everybody looked at the at the guy who was running the auction, he was like, "I had no, I don't, I have no idea what that what what happened." <laughs> Like we, oh. <laughs> we didn't know, we didn't know there was a shredder in there. We didn't we didn't check that and just said we got banksied. Oh my god, you got shredded. And it's crazy. He, he made Banksy made an entire park called Dismal Land that was one giant middle finger to Disney, making a whole mm -hmm. ma trying to make the most depressing park possible as a <laughs> um dark joke. But isn't this still a uh, like? Already heard to be depressing because of that one tunnel. <laughs> um, you know, you can always you can always make it worse. I mean, just look, oh my just, god! I mean, I I've had to understand that firsthand. Just looking at their financials every month, <laughs> they lost half a bill. They lost half a billion dollars in thirty days. Oh my god! It's a lot. <laughs> some people depressing. look at that as a tra some people look at that as a tragedy. I see it as a comedy. Yeah, yeah, tragedy and comedy. <laughs> as when, well, aside from the fact that Mel Brooks had once said, "Tragedy is when I cut my finger. Comedy is when you fall into an open sewer hole and die." Oh my god! <laughs> you know, the joke is it's always funny when it happens to somebody else. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh. But I do think it the. That sort of question is is one of the things that's going to be important, since obviously in real world history, once firearms started to be introduced, mm -hmm. that that particular com that particular uh, that was such a revelation and such a change that it forced mm -hmm. a lot of armies and a lot of the way people fought to change with it. Yeah, yeah. Even when 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 firearms were f were first put were first put in. A lot of people were like, "It's that's a lot. It's a loud and expensive thing. Why should why should we use that when we can use this crossbow that's that's quiet and e and easy to put together?" Mm -hmm. Well, it's because firearms could go through armor. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, and I I can't remember the battle, but but one side ended up just completely trouncing his opponent because he had guns, mm -hmm. while his opponent was just was just using was using crossbows and knights. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's a, it has an advantage. Mm -hmm. Which, when it comes to dealing with that on a um, on a sci-fi setting, it's important it's important to answer to answer that particular question, whether it be through something supernatural like psychics or or something through technology. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. In the game, there's like three elements, like mm -hmm. physical, ether, which is the magic, and tech, which is the guns, the mm -hmm. the bombs, etc. So, yeah. there they they there's a elemental triangle system. So, physical is strong against tech. So, when they're dealing with machines or something, things like that, um, physical element is much more stronger. But tech is stronger against the magic or the magical side of things mm -hmm. because um, technology can sort of like go, is designed to sort of like um, hinder the the psychicness of people or something like that. You know the way um, technology is made to weaken the mind or something. So, mm -hmm. and then ether or magic is then strong against physical. So it's like an, a triangle thing. Which makes which makes sense given your given you mentioning um wanting wanting to do something fire emblem like in in the past and mm -hmm. with that you have the rock paper scissors setup that is used yeah. in the weapon triangle or even in something like Mega Man. 
Like all of the mm -hmm. boss design in Mega Man since day one has been built on rock, paper, scissors design. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, even even if even if some even if some bosses um don't didn't quite get the memo. Looking at you, Metal Man. <laughs> <laughs> With the sub with the sub weapon that's just OP. Oh yeah, super OP. Mm -hmm. And or 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 on the opposite end of the spectrum, Bubble Man and the useless bubbles. <laughs> but I think bubbles. Mm -hmm. Like I always saw bubbles as a thing you blow and get, and get popped, not as a, not as a threatening weapon. Exactly, like. Who threatens people with bubbles? <laughs> like, throwing ice at somebody? Yeah, that can be threatening. I've seen mm -hmm. what avalanches do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh. Plus, given plus given where I live, the the, th the threat of snow is ever present, and I've seen what what happens when um when th when the roads get when the roads get iced with the, when there's no um salt on. Oh good, my god! Good luck crazy. trying to drive in that. Oh my god. <laughs> I mean, can you? Yeah. Should you? No. <laughs> if only if you like gambling, with your life. Yeah, <laughs> with your life. But now, what I have, I have danced around the writing end of things, and some some of that is because no matter how no matter how old or new something, I'm always hesitant about going into writing in a in a way that would spoil. I want any, I want anybody's experience to be as fresh as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, I I only tr I only try and spoil things when I feel when I feel like um trolling somebody. <laughs> yeah. Or or um or in some in some cases where people would put up no spoilers in forums, I'd I'd um I'd spo I'd spoil the most uh, I'd I'd write in spoilers of the most obvious things. Oh my god, <laughs> this weekend. <laughs> just to just to like the things that you'd get in like the first chapter. Oh my god! <laughs> and then say technically it's not a spoiler because it's the first because it's on the back of the book. Oh my! But god. <laughs> obviously, with this you've had, you've had to wear a lot of hats, being both designer and and writer. Mm -hmm. And I'd like I'd like to hear some of the ups and downs when it comes to when it came, when it came to the the writing experience in that process since. Obviously, writing the story for a role-playing game is going to involve a lot more text than other genres. Yes, yes. Like that writing for me is like the craziest part because I do have this idea, but then when you put it like on paper, like a lot of th stuff are good, but when you know when it's applied, you're going to see a lot of inconsistencies, and I had to fix a lot of that throughout the development of Braveheart. There's a lot of story inconsistencies that what this was happening because I couldn't, like I couldn't keep up with all of them, and I was like, wait, wait a minute, there's this is a plot hole. I should fix this. And people were pointing them out. There were like people who played my game or gave feedback, and they were pointing out the plot holes. So I had to like work on those stuff during the development process. It was very like. To me, it was very daunting, but it was fun. It was a fun experience, you know, because um, at times when I write, there are times where I just forget, like, oh, this isn't logical. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and some of that is inevitable when, again, you're wearing all of the hats. Exactly. <laughs> so it's it's less of it's less of wearing hats and more like um, spinning plates. Yeah. <laughs> What's crazy is I did remember um one of the, the the craziest feedback I got from my first ever game, you know, Blue Skies, my very first RPG. Mm -hmm. Um, in his review, he said, "You don't you don't strip logic naked and then beat it with a stick and then kick it on the balls. That's what you're doing with this game." And I was like, "What? Is my logic really crazy in this game?" And I have to agree with him. That was like I had a lot of learning process there <laughs> and my mentor would often say the first thing you do sucks with... yeah exactly <laughs> and i can i can i can under i can understand that and it's it can it can sometimes be tricky to um parse parse between what's gen what's genuine feedback and what is um 
what is some, mm -hmm. what is somebody putting in a what I what I would do kind of um, approach, which isn't isn't always helpful because because <laughs> well, I, well there's well nobody else is star mage but you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but even even with that, oh, was th was there any case in development of either? Um, Raveheart or or any of the previous works that you felt that you had walked in, that you had painted yourself into a corner and had to had had to dial it back. Um, you mean like where I felt like I want to give up or something? Not not necessarily give up, but that but that the way things were going, there it wasn't progressing. So just so just take a few steps back and um change the approach. Oh yeah, yeah. Um. It was it was a lot like when every time because what happens is every time when I just feel like things aren't progressing, I'd go on a long hiatus. Like that's what I do. I I go on a one year hiatus or a month's hiatus, and when I go back, it's just like my mind is fresh again. So that's sort of like my way or my sort of solution is to take a break, like a long break, because. I get burned out easily when developing these games and especially when I do it for like months straight and when I get burned out um I get like you know I I get weak when it comes to development I don't know what I'm doing and things just start falling apart so that's why if I get burned out I just leave it be for a while you know go on a long hiatus mm -hmm. which definitely makes sense now, mm -hmm. I know now. Raveheart for Raveheart's been out for a, for a little bit on both Steam and on Itch. Mm -hmm. um, what would you, what would you say would be would be the next thing that you'd have that you'd have pl have planned for? Um, for is it go? It, are you going to be continuing this journey with um, sci-fi fantasy, or is there a different approach you plan on taking with your next project? Um, yeah, um, so right now I'm currently working on Blue Skies 3, which is a fantasy game and a sequel to the f previous Blue Skies 1 and 2. And um, this is not really like the story is still, like you can still understand the story the same way like in Final Fantasy where there's like 1, 2, 3, 4, but they're all different stories. That's my approach with this title. So the series is going to have their own story. So Blue Sky Street will not be something that you'll be confused if you play it directly. And right now I'm also developing um, Heroes of the Seasons, which is a boss rush turn-based RPG um, made for a Christmas jam. And I plan to release it as a commercial game on Steam soon. And yeah, I hope it will be enjoyed by people. <laughs> And I'll I'll certainly look forward to it. And when and when those are further along, I'd love I'd love to bring you back into the temple. Of course, I would be happy and honored. Mm -hmm. Well, with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. <laughs> of course, thank you so much as well for having me. It's an honor that you reached out. And. Anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say mm -hmm. around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will mm -hmm. be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then... On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>